welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. Welcome back, people. I'm really excited about today's episode. Today, I welcome three doctors to the podcast all at once. Uh, so it's going to be a wild ride. And actually, it was fantastic. I was worried about it. It turned out to be amazing. Um, we're talking about women's hormones. We're specifically talking about bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. We're talking about the myths, who should and shouldn't be thinking about this short answer is most women should be, and especially under the supervision of a knowledgeable doctor, virtually all women, not all, there's always exceptions to every rule. And we talk about, is it ever too late to start? Um, my three guests today are, well, they're amazing. Two of them have been with me before. One is brand new to the podcast. The brand new guest is Dr. Erica Schwartz, who has authored six best-selling books along with medical articles, blogs, uh, magazine articles, and some of the biggest magazines around. Um, she is doctor to celebrities and stars and pro athletes. She practices out of New York and she is well, she's nothing short of amazing. Wait till you meet this woman. Um, she also has a YouTube channel. She's just great. She started off like so many doctors in emergency medicine, internal medicine, and figured out pretty early in the game that she just wasn't able to help people get better and thus began her journey into the functional and regenerative and, you know, couldn't we call it maybe pro-aging space? I'm not a big fan, as you know, of the anti-aging term. So let's call it pro-aging. Um, um, my next guest is Dr. Suzanne Turner, who has been on the podcast before. She's a functional medicine doctor. She's a speaker, an educator, a business owner, an athlete. She is also amazing. <laughs> These, all three of them, really, frankly, are amazing. Uh, she focuses um, on senolytics, cognitive optimization, peptides, anti-aging performance, and longevity. If you didn't listen to our interview yet, I recorded an interview with her a few months ago on cognitive performance in the boardroom. There are lots of great ideas and um, things to pick up in there. And last but certainly not least is um, a regular... Uh, guest on this podcast is Dr. Elizabeth Yurth, goes by Betsy Yurth as well. Uh, she is the owner and founder of the Boulder Longevity Institute in Boulder, Colorado. She practices orthopedic medicine, regenerative medicine, pro-aging medicine, and she is also passionate, like all, all both of the other guests, passionate about educating people on not only what um, medical procedures they might want to be considering, but also about your foundational health, about what is it that you can do in your life day to day that's going to support your health and optimize your performance. So all three of these doctors, I, I invite you to look into all three of them. They've actually recently started a YouTube channel together, um, which I'm really excited about. I think we're going to learn a ton from them. Um, and it's always a gift when you can get three incredible people like this on a podcast together. So once again, it's Dr. Erica Schwartz, Dr. Suzanne Turner, and Dr. Elizabeth Yurth. You can find Dr. Schwartz online at eshealth.com. So E is in Erica, S is in Schwartz, health.com. Dr. Suzanne Turner is vinemedical.com and also drsmd.com is um, she she's got a bunch of a few different websites going on right now. And then last but not least, again, is Dr. Elizabeth Yurth and she's Boulder Longevity Institute dot com. And um, yeah, that's it. I hope that you enjoy this podcast. There's lots of amazing information in here. Uh, they gave me the gift of a ton of time. So if you have any questions, comments, any feedback on this episode at all, be sure that, of course, you can reach out to any of them 
or you can reach out to me through my website, which is natnidham.com, or you can find me on Facebook in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, which is just Natalie Nidham, and also on Clubhouse. I'm hosting regular rooms on Clubhouse at different times on different topics. And that's just my name, Natalie Nidham again. And please remember that if you get value from this podcast, please, please, please share it out, share it to your networks, your friends, anybody who you think will also get value from it and leave us a review because it's those reviews that help the podcast be seen, be listened to, and allows me to get you amazing, amazing guests every week. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you guys. And uh, don't forget that none of the information here is should be construed as medical advice. You must speak with a medical professional, especially when it comes to hormones, but anything at all that we talk about on this podcast, this is all for information purposes only. This is about keeping you on the cutting edge of all of the different things you can be doing to keep yourself energized, optimized, and as amazing as you already are. So thanks again for being here and enjoy the episode. Well, this is an exciting day. Welcome to today's episode. I would like to welcome Dr. Erica Schwartz, Dr. Suzanne Turner, and Dr. Elizabeth Yurth. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thank you for having us here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is going to be fun. I've done I've done two on one before. I've never done three, so this is going to be super cool. Um, but these ladies have done this before, so I'm going to rely on you to help me to manage this. So today we're talking about, as everybody knows, we're talking about women's hormones because well, because we're complex, fascinating, and mysterious creatures, and it's the symphony playing in the background that really ultimately allows everything else to happen. Um, Elizabeth and I were talking because we always talk before podcasts um, about how so often it is the place to start because ultimately it sets the stage for everything else that we want to affect in women's health, be it metabolic health or ability to exercise, mental health, like the whole nine yards. There's nothing that doesn't really come out of this, this foundation of balanced hormones. So the big elephant in the room, and I'm going to start with Erica, uh, in the big elephant in the room when it comes to bioidentical hormone therapy, and certainly even in my practice as a nutritionist and a health coach, I mention hormone replacement to women and half of them are in the boat and the other half shrink back in horror going, oh my God, I would never do that. What about cancer? What about, you know, what about all these things? So I'm turning it over to you, Erica, and let's start the conversation and everybody get take a turn about say, women's, like the safety of doing hormone replacement. Well, let's put it into the perspective that when you're in your 20s, you're overflowing with hormones, right? And you're fertile, you don't have wrinkles, you have energy, you lose weight when you want to lose weight. Um, you wake up in the morning and you're ready to go and there are no chronic illnesses. And that's when you're full of hormones. What we're talking about is when you lose your hormones and you start going into menopause and which is not just stopping your period, but the 10 years before you stop your period, essentially, and you lose your hormones, you start getting sick. You start having, um, you lose your libido, which is a terrible thing. You yeah. lose your ability to think clearly. You're in a brain fog. You get wrinkles. You can't think straight. And it's really a problem. You get a chronic illnesses. So hormones are absolutely important for you if you want to stay young and a contributor to society. There's no question about the safety of hormones. This is not 2002. This is 13 years later. That study that put the kibosh on hormones had nothing to do with reality. It was retracted in 2017, and we're still talking about it, which is a shame because the medical community should know better, and women desperately need hormones. And yeah. I'll turn it over to my pals, my <laughs> thank the you, women I love. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna agree. I mean, this the biggest thing I get is you know, when I I tell everybody they need hormones, and is that well, I can't. You know, my doctor said they cause cancer. And if I put people on hormones, their doctors take them off. And, you know, and I would say that's more the norm than not. And I think what we have to look at, I mean, Erica's exactly right. The Women's Health Initiative study 
was retracted actually by the authors who said it was misinterpreted and and inaccurate and the way the data was interpreted was not what they were what, what they really wanted to get out there and so they they themselves the authors of that study retracted the study and that got no play wow. and and so we have these these doctors who are still quoting that study as the the, the study that you know is the end all be all to stopping hormones I think the other thing we have to look at is people get so afraid of cancer mm -hmm. on the list of the things you're going to die from. Cancer is way down from cardiovascular disease, from dementia, from an osteoporotic fracture. It's actually fifth on that list. So we look huh. at this horrible cancer fear. And I, you know, if you have a hip fracture, so even an osteoporotic hip fracture, and I see that in 50 year olds, an osteoporotic hip fracture. So orthopedics is my background then you have a 55% chance in the next three years of dying. You're like kidding. People who have a hip fracture will die because they now have changed their exercise level. They never got ambulatory again. They're in chronic pain. So it, this is not a benign disease. Osteoporosis is not a benign disease. Mm -hmm. My own mother who, who recently passed away, passed away from a fracture. And, you know, and, and why aren't we talking about that? Why, why don't the primary care doctors who pull all my patients off their hormones say, well, if you don't, if you're not on hormones, I don't care what you do, you are going to get osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, and then, you know, Erica talks about the brain. You know, how many people do you know who are in their, already in their fifties saying that they're not thinking as clearly, their memory is not as good. Oh, I'm getting older. My, you know, I just don't remember as well. Yeah. Well, that's the first sign that your brain is starting to head down that pathway of dementia. Yeah. And, you know, again, I, me, that's a huge fear from for me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I and don't that's mean, cost of estrogen, right? The, um, the yeah, we know that estrogen is one of the signals for mm -hmm. the um, the death cell, the the inflammasome, which is the death um, causer. So one of the signals for that is is a deficiency in estrogen, and so your brain cells are more likely to die in response to just everything we're exposed to all the time is if estrogen deficiency is part of your milieu, then that will be a, the secondary signal to say, yeah, go ahead and kill off this brain cell because there isn't any estrogen. She's not going to be reproducing. So let's go ahead and take care of this brain cell. Um, and we begin to see this decline uh, um, in cognitive function. And then we take into account the fact that hormones are so involved in how well we sleep and how critical to our overall wellness our sleep is, making sure our circadian rhythm is accurate and is on track. That, that if your hormones are off balance and you're not sleeping well, you are set up not only for that, that death cell to occur, but but also for your circadian clock to be messed up. And now everything else that goes along with a disrupt disrupted circadian clock, everything else goes wrong. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the loss of sleep is, is the loss of another hormone, right? The growth hormone, which is Absolutely. so critical to keeping us young and, and vibrant. So it's a way other nature actually takes us out. Yeah. And I think that if we don't have hormones and we, all these horrible things happen, that we're all talking about and it's mother nature's way of taking us out because we're not important on the food chain anymore. We're not reproducing ourselves anymore. We're done. Right. So that doesn't mean that we're not contributors to society. And I think that, you know, advances when we're talking about what's going on in genetic coding and the CRISPR and everything else, we're forgetting about the simple thing that hormones are what takes us out. Yeah. Well, and most of the concern with that WHI study was uh, when they when they teased out the data, most of the concern was with the use of the artificial progestin, which you must realize is very different from the progesterone that your body naturally makes. Both men and women, this is not an exclusively female hormone, uh, progesterone. And this this is the this is does so many things in your body, progesterone progesterone does that you must have real progesterone. If you're giving yourself artificial progesterone, which is what was used in that study. And in many studies of hormone safety, uh, please be careful to look, if you're looking at those studies, to look to see whether they are using progestins or if they're using progesterone, which is what your body naturally makes. The 
Progestins will actually block the ability of your natural progesterone to do its job. You will deplete your natural progesterone. And then you have another deficiency that your body is saying, okay, she's not going to be reproducing. Let's just let her go. Wow. That's amazing. So that's really interesting. And I think that you may, you just made a really interesting point is that, I mean, we're going to stick to girl talk because we're here to talk about women's hormones, but, but the point that progesterone is a men, male and female hormone. Estrogen is a male and female hormone and testosterone is a male and female hormone. And I think that, you know, again, I was, we were just talking about this earlier, the loss of testosterone to women is so undervalued and undertreated by, by a lot of practitioners because it's like, well, you're a woman, like you don't need testosterone. And I'm, and I remember learning not that long ago that testosterone is one of our dominant hormones and, and it falls off the cliff when we go through menopause, like gone. So I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, even before then. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Testosterone drops actually very, very young. So testosterone is actually at its highest around puberty. <laughs> so really, if you look at most 30 year olds, they have very low testosterone. And, and, you know, I go to the gym and I'm stronger than most of the 30 year olds there. And, you know, and, and so it, it, this is I, I think we need to really start looking at hormones at younger ages. I, you know, I think that we'd rather not have damage get done. So I think it is something that, that we need to be looking at earlier. But this even if your doctor is savvy enough to put you on estrogen and progesterone, I never see women put on testosterone. I, mean, I don't know. Do you guys? I just I don't see it from outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think that I'm starting to see some of them, but it's usually in the form that, you know, I'm not a big fan of, as we were talking about the other day, but at least they're realizing some of them. And I think it's crucial what, the, you know, Betsy just said about, uh, uh, you know, and Suzanne, I mean, testosterone is a most important hormone. I mean, and women make more testosterone when they're making it. And then, and I think the fact that we minimize its importance and we only give it to people who are elite athletes seems to me yeah. criminal because women need testosterone. Women need testosterone for their bones, they need for their brain, for their muscle, and muscle being the organ that makes women stay young. And women right. have the muscles, they don't have muscles, right. which is really scary. So Betsy can address that. Yeah. That we were just talking about that earlier. So we don't think of muscle as an organ and it is. In fact, yeah. we're finding that it's, it's a huge, important organ and it's all over our body and it's produces, it produces hormones, produces what are called myokines and myokines are absolutely essential for bone. So if you don't have myokines, so if you're sarcopenic, like you don't have muscle and you're not making myokines, it doesn't matter what you do. You can't rebuild bone. So we have to rebuild muscle to make bone stronger. So my kinds are important for, uh, they, they have end, far reaching benefits. They actually are beneficial to brain health or uh, beneficial for your GI health. You know, so you can't ignore the fact that, you know, and, and we even see in our practices, you know, women who really downplay how important it is to have muscles, but it really is important. And, you know, and, and the only way you can really keep muscles and keep strong is to have some androgens on board. And so we have to look at that. We have to look at, at replacing what what we need, which is replacing muscle, because the muscle is going to produce these myokines that are really important for bone health. Not to mention sex health, sexual health as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Without androgens on board, you're not going to have sex health. You're not going to have normal orgasms. None of that's going to happen. It's interesting. Um, there's an OBGYN nearby who refers me patients whenever she sees a small clitoris because she knows that, a, a, that there is a physical uh, change in the with a deficiency in testosterone. And you see that change when you administer you know, exogenous testosterone in various forms that are available. I think the other thing that's really important uh, with, with muscles, in addition to the myokines, is the uh, ability to manage insulin and, and blood sugar mm -hmm. well. 
And so how it metabolically takes care of that sugar. So I explain it to patients by saying, if you, um, if you exercise, your exercising muscle opens up the gates to allow blood sugar in without requiring insulin. So now your cells are actually able to handle that sugar load that you just ate. And so nothing is better than a good walk or a good exercise right after your uh, meal, because that begins to uh, create muscle because of your, uh, you've just eaten a meal, go out and do some weight training. Yeah. Amazing. Well, even just a walk after a meal, right. Um, manages that postprandial blood sugar response, which ultimately is it's, you know, I, I describe it similarly to you, Suzanne, maybe less technically it's just that it gives that glucose a destination and a purpose because right. you've, you've created a, a place for it to go where you need it, which is actually going to make you more able to have that workout again the next day because your muscles are fueled. So it right. becomes this self-sustaining um, kind of cycle. Yeah, we're we're all fortunate enough to be involved in this scientific seed scientific research and performance. We're all on faculty, and um, and we were just at a meeting and we were talking about that. You know that that if you can just get your your patients or your clients to walk for twenty minutes. <laughs> After after a meal. Now, Eric and I did go out for Turkish food and ate so much that we had to walk for about two hours afterwards. But, <laughs> it worked. It was great. But, and we were still full. But um, right. But in general, don't eat as much as we did. But then, you know, that 20 minute walk is so critically important. Yeah, we just had a conversation about that. That You know, that timing, how you eat protein, your carbs and that meal is important and just going for a 20 minute walk. But that is a big reason is because that muscle stimulation is going to give the glucose a place to go and it's going to keep you from storing fat. So that's such an easy thing to do. And none of us, you know, we just don't do it. Well, it's easy, but it's become weird. Whereas in certain yeah. cultures, it's the norm. It was the right? norm. It was the norm and, and it may still be in some places. Okay. Let's get back to our topic of hormones because we can, we, we can just keep chatting on this vein quite nicely. So um, I think it was Suzanne who, who spoke to the Premarin versus um, the difference between a bioidentical hormone and a pharmaceutical type of synthetic hormone, let's say. Um, again, I mean, I feel like, you know, it's funny. I feel like in the world I'm in, I'm like, well, of course, everybody knows you need bioidentical, not synthetic. And yet I think there's still a lot of people out there who don't know. So maybe can, we can briefly just touch on this, this difference between the synthetic version of a hormone and a bioidentical. Never mind the fact that I remember once trying a synthetic version of, I think it was estradiol and it just about bloomed. Like I was, I had such a horrible reaction to it. <laughs> like I was allergic to something in it. So maybe we'd like to talk a little, just touch on this whole bioidentical versus synthetic versions of hormones. Erica. <laughs> Okay. So um, bioidentical is a kind of relatively new term. Before it was called bioidentical, they were called natural hormones because they were molecularly they are molecularly identical to the hormones our body makes: estradiol, progesterone, testosterone. Now, what Suzanne was referring to was the synthetic progestin which is Provera, which was part of the study in the Women's Health Initiative that turns out to have been the bad guy. That was it. Premarin is the synthetic pregnant horse's urine, pregnant mare's urine, Premarin. And um, that was also in the study, but it didn't do half the harm that Provera was doing. So um, there are women to this day, and I think that there are doctors who are still prescribing Premarin, um, but that doesn't make it right. The other thing is that bioidentical hormones are available in FDA approved preparations. So estradiol is available in oral form, which I don't use, but it's also available in gel form through estrogel, divigel, which are FDA approved. They're very expensive and I, most insurance companies won't pay for them, but they work equally as good, if not better, than compounded by identical hormone estradiol. So when the, the distinction is made between compounded and FDA approved, it's a wrong distinction because mm -hmm. estradiol exists in both compounded and FDA approved preparations. Okay. So 
the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology doesn't seem to be clear on that. So the doctors aren't clear on it because the North American Menopause Society is giving them the wrong information. So the next part of it is progesterone. So progesterone, as Suzanne said, is progesterone is the hormone that we make. Progesterone in compounded cream form, oral form, which actually Prometrium is the first progesterone that actually came to market, which is an FDA approved drug. Um, <clears throat> they're bioidentical. They are natural. They work the same way as our own hormones work. So again, the distinction is not between FDA approved and compounded, but rather between molecular formula and not knowing the molecular formula. <laughs> and birth control pills are synthetic hormones. Um, IUD, it's like Mirena, is a synthetic hormone. Um, bioidentical hormones cannot be used to provide birth control. They're not going to stop women from ovulating. They're going to help women balance their hormones. So that's where the synthetic hormones are not what, why would you want something? When you do bloods on women who, have, who are on birth control pills, they have hormone levels, estrogen, progesterone levels that are the same as my, uh, menopausal women. So it's kind of weird that we don't, the doctors don't seem to get that or pay attention to what that does. So you have these 30 year old women with osteopenia. It's what Betsy oh just, God. you know, so there's a lot of stuff that you would like to know more about and you like to understand because once you understand hormones a little bit, then you make the right choices. Like you give people testosterone, you give them progesterone, you give them estradiol and whether it's in compounded form and in injectable form, as long as it is identical to the hormones that we make when we're young then you're doing well. If they're synthetic, they may work and they're going to work in many way, in many instances, but they'll work better if they're bioidentical. Mm -hmm. Well, the body will recognize them and be able to clear them or do whatever it needs to do with them. So for women on birth control, you're saying they're basically being thrown into a state as if they were menopausal? Suzanne, you you don't have to take that because this is, I mean, you know, I kind of took my eye off that a while ago. So, <laughs> yes, effectively they are. They're, uh, you know, because they're at risk, increased risk for osteoporosis, because they're, uh, they're, their estrogen and progesterone are suppressed and their SHBG rises, sex hormone binding globulin rises. This is a, a binder that goes around and sort of acts like the over flow valve on your bathtub, it binds up all the excess hormones. It unfortunately also binds up excess testosterone, excess thyroid hormone, um, not, and not only estrogen and progesterone, but those as well. So you just have to be aware that when you're taking birth control pills, you're raising that SHBG super high. So all your hormones are going to de be depleted. They might be present in the blood. You might be able to see them, but almost all of them will be bound. Down, to yeah. Sorry, I'm Betsy. I'm shocked because of the number of 16 year olds I see being put yeah. on birth control because they have cramps or, acne or, or, yeah, acne they're, and, or mm -hmm. PCOS, which I'm right. starting to think is really a catch all phrase for things that doctors can't figure out. So they just tell them, Oh, you have PCOS. You need to be on the birth control pill. Um, yeah. I think that, um, that, that, that is such a misconception and it's hard because what is a, a great birth control method? It's, it, it, it is very hard. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you do it right, the rhythm method that works, but, you know, using condoms works, but that it's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough thing to advise women. One of the things to acknowledge is that, for instance, one of the reasons that so many young women do get depressed on birth control pills is because they're suppressing progesterone. Mm -hmm. Progesterone has a huge antidepressant effect. So, so remember, that's one of the reasons as we get to be perimenopausal, when progesterone levels start to really drop, the people, women have a lot more depression and anxiety is low progesterone. So you can use progesterone along with the birth control pills and some of these, these girls at least actually help with some of that, some of that depression and things. I mean, I'm not a fan of birth control pills, but I also don't have the greatest advice on what is a, a really, you know, good birth control method for some of these people who, you know, are not going to follow a good taking, you know, ovulation yeah. temperatures and all that kind of stuff. Well, it takes a certain um, amount of maturity and commitment to, to manage yeah. your fertility otherwise, I guess. Um, Okay. Um, so we've talked about a little bit about the Erica safety. Disagrees. What, Erica, what do you tell your young patients for birth control? 
No, I agree. Actually, I agree. I, I you know, I'm a big uh, para guard IUD without, um, yeah. without hormones. Yeah, I, I but, agree. You know, I was I just gave a talk um, to a group of women who were all in their t- well, early twenties to late twenties, maybe, um, at one of the corporations, and um, they were all talking about the lack of libido, and that's something that nobody talks about. The women were on birth control pills have no libido. So how is that okay for a 20 something year old woman who should be having the same level of sexual interest as a 25 year old man? Uh, why would they not have a libido? And that's because you're suppressing the hormones. That's exactly what Betty and Suzanne said. Right. So it's kind of offensive that we accept that. Mm-hmm. The women and the, doc- the doctors don't really care because they don't live in our bodies. So, and the women who or, you know, the female doctors don't understand because they're not being trained to understand it. So yeah. right. it's they have seven minutes to see you. So they really have the time to say, are you, are you menopausal or not? If you're over menopause, then we're going to give you Primbro. If you're under menopause, we're going to give you birth control. That solves everything. See you later. Yeah. Right. Well, and they also ask the question, you know, if somebody comes in, I don't want to get pregnant. I'm sexually active. Okay. Here's the birth control pill. I mean, like they, they're looking at the one thing without right. looking without at the, the rest of the whole picture. Yeah. It's which just, is very distressing. Yeah. Right. That is disappointing. And, and remember to Suzanne's point about suppressing these other hormones is that, you know, so progesterone is estrogen is not the whole end all be all for bone. Testosterone and progesterone are equally important. In fact, for stabilizing bone, estrogen is great for stabilizing bone. For forming new bone, you have to have testosterone, and and you have to have progesterone. So when those get suppressed, that's why you're seeing osteopenia in these twenty year olds. Is that we've now suppressed all of these. So even if you're giving them a synthetic estrogen, which may actually support the bone, you suppress everything else that's necessary for bone integrity. You know, so and, and then some of these women, too, once you've suppressed the sex hormone binding globulin or you have this high sex hormone binding globulin, so you've bound all these hormones, recovery, even after you stop the pill, t- can take a long, long time. That's why we have such a big business of fertility, IVF, because they go over the control pills and they're not ovulating and it's a disaster. Right. But we have a few billion dollar business that puts them all on IVF and women accept it. And that's because they don't know any better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, wow. Okay. Well, we're, we've gone, we've gone south of menopause again. We keep doing that, but that's okay. Because you know what? We leave no woman behind. <laughs> this, is, this is girl talk. So that's, um, so we talked a little bit about the safety with respect to, um, to the women's health initiative, which we all understand is outdated. <laughs> God knows the authors even have tried to re- to retract it. They they can't seem to get the genie back in the bottle. But can we talk a little bit also about women with a family history of cancer or people who have a certain genetic predisposition to to breast cancer? Do do you treat them any differently? Like, or do you just monitor them more closely? Like, how do you address? those concerns with your, with your patients. And by the way, I've decided this is absolutely going out on video so that people can watch this and see who's saying what and what interaction. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the things I do and, um, is I do follow hormone metabolites when I put my women on, on hormones. So usually when women come in and they're postmenopausal, their hormones are zero, but we'll start them on some hormones. And then what I do is a urine test that follows urine metabolites. And I can see if the estrogen is going down into a more dangerous form. So there's really three metabolites of estrogen, a two hydroxy, which then gets methylated into two methoxy, which is a really good protective estrogen or 4-hydroxyestrone, which can actually become what's called a reactive quinone and damage your DNA, or 16-hydroxyestrone. And so there's three different pathways, which are largely genetic, based on some of the cytochrome pathways, and a lot environmental as well. So when you know what's happening with those hormones, am I driving it into a 4-hydroxy pathway so I know that woman is high risk, then we have to do things to change the metabolism. And there are some simple ways to doing that. Oftentimes you can use methane, which is what's in broccoli and cauliflower to help block for hydroxyestrone. You can use calcium D glucurate to help get rid use what that's what we call glucuronidation. It helps get rid of the four hydroxyestrone. You can use iodine, um, you know, in some of these women who are making a lot of four hydroxyestrones. 
So if you know how people are metabolizing, then there's some simple ways that you can change the metabolites. How about you guys? Love it. I started using, I do, I do the same urine metabolite testing for them. And, um, the, uh, the other thing that I thought about is a lot of these patients who have, uh, who have this, sometimes it's all in their microbiome. So if you work on fixing their microbiome, even something as simple as butyrate, you guys laugh at me when I say rectal butyrate, <laughs> it works. No, we're using it for everything now, Suzanne. I know, I know. I use it on everybody. In their microbiome, then their micro, then their, then their um, microbiome is not going to be making the beta glucuronidase, and now they're going to be able to actually clear their um, estrogen. So, you, if you just fix the microbiome, you might not have that problem in the first place—the over, mm -hmm. the, the excess problem, the wrong pathways problem. Um, and so, I think if we can get patients' uh, intestinal bugs fixed, I think that. A lot of that problem doesn't occur. Uh, even with patients with, that have a genetic predisposition, it's difficult to convince. I, I'm just moving out of an insurance model. So it's difficult to get patients to convince them that they are safe on hormones. And I'm not going to convince somebody. Not, I'm not going to spend my time convincing. Right. I will mention yeah. repeatedly, I think this is because of your hormone deficiency. I think you're feeling these symptoms because of your blah, blah, blah. But I'm not ever going to say you must do it. I'm going to wait until they're symptomatic enough that they can't stand it anymore. And then we'll treat them. Yeah. And I treat them the same. I might do a metabolite test more often in a patient who has, uh, you know, if I change anything, I might do a metabolite test more often in a patient who has a history of breast cancer or a family history or a known genetic predisposition, uh, I might do that. I'm also looking at, um, you know, all their other detoxification markers, like an 80-HDG and a homocysteine, and I'm looking at all those pathways too. So I'm trying to optimize them physically in general. And then we, then we know that they're going to handle their hormones just like they handled them when they were 25. I love it. Right. Yeah. Uh, in New York, we're not allowed to do 24 hour urines, which is like the urine test, which Betsy was referring to, which is so important. So New York is not OK. So I uh, have to do what Suzanne says, which at the end of the day really works out really well because you're looking at the whole patient and you're taking care of the entire picture. And, you know, I try to if they live out of New York state, you could send the 24 hour urine, but it's kind of one of the regulatory ridiculousness because somebody blocked it. <laughs> so wow. just, yeah. So uh, well, we do the same thing. Everybody's on butyrate. Butyrate. Yeah. So wait, somebody mentioned rectal butyrate. Are we talking about suppositories? Yes. Or really? enemas. Or enema. enemas. <laughs> or enemas. <laughs> which, that, which just absorbs through the rectum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we have like yeah. oral butyrate now, right? Yes. Well, free bu pro butyrate, yeah, it yeah. turns into you. You can't take butyrate orally, but because it, it won't reach the, the intestine. But you can take. Um, Suzanne turned us all onto a product that's a pro butyrate. It actually turns into butyrate in the lower intestine, and so which actually has some really good evidence behind it. You know, so which I think product all of is us, that? I need to know. <laughs> um, it's called tributyrin. Tributyrin. Um, yeah. So we were actually this conference we just at was all gut, and honestly you can sort of say, say everything comes down to repairing the gut, oh, yeah. but people start throwing, simply throwing probiotics in. If you don't have a normal gut lining, it doesn't work. And that's where Suzanne's been using butyrate for a long time. She's gotten Eric and I much more into it over the past year, I guess, but um, she's been using it for a long time on, on clients who, are, who have illnesses. And it's a huge piece. She's right for metabolism is that you've got to have a healthy gut. And if you don't have a healthy gut, nothing else is going to go right. So I do think it's going to come back to, you can fix almost everybody with some butyrate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and butyrate is, uh, it's food for the colon cells, right? That's exactly what it is. It's the, yeah. it's the source of fuel for your colon colonocytes. So you have to give them butyrate and we can't make it ourselves. Our bacteria have to make it, but if you don't have an intact colon, then the anaerobics that make, the anaerobes that make butyrate can't live and so it becomes a vicious cycle so you have and to replace who, the butyrate who's first got a healthy who's got a healthy microbiome anyway right. anymore in the u.s days, right well yeah, yeah in the US, almost anywhere at this stage of the game. i mean unless people are living somewhere in the mountains away from from civilization it's i think it's tough right i think part of the reason why it's so hard for a lot of these companies that claim to assess the microbiome and and optimize it is 
the absence of the Holy Grail. Like, do we actually know what a great microbiome looks like? Mm. You know, yeah. how much of it is bio individual and unique to the individual? And how, where, I remember when Viome first started, they mm. went out looking for a thousand people who fit a certain criteria that they could call having a healthy microbiome. And I think they went through hell and high water <laughs> trying to find a thousand people who hadn't been on, I don't know how many courses of antibiotics, who hadn't been Mills. birth control, medications, mm -hmm. stress, sleep deprivation, exposure to clay. I mean, like, you know, it's, it, it's a bit of a daunting task and, and even whatever they ended up finding as that thousand person cohort would have been compromised in some way. Right. Yeah. So I've looked into recently um, going back to, I have a couple of patients who have uh, C. diff colitis that I've collected recently. I don't mean I've collected their C. diff. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, they have come to me. And so several of them came to me asking for fecal transplant. And of course, there's tons of research about fecal transplant and the benefits. But then the concern for me is they're pulling from a medical school pretty much. So these are 25 year old people, men and women. And most of them are getting, most of the women in medical school, I was one. On birth on birth control. So now oh, yeah. I'm taking the microbiome from a woman on birth control pills. What am I doing to me if I'm taking their fecal transplant? Yeah. So, right. Not to mention the stress that they're under. And the miserable life that they're living right now. <laughs> Absolutely. So I don't want their microbiome. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And, and, and then the same company does a, they've collected the stool and then they actually kill the, um, the bugs and they leave the stuff, which if, what's in the stuff, butyrate. Butyrate. <laughs> so I said to myself, why would I go this route? I'm just going to use butyrate. Yeah, butyrate. Right. I look yeah. at it makes it for me. Safer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah. It, honestly, <laughs> I think that that, and it's a great point. And I haven't really even thought about it as much, Suzanne, is that that probably should be when we see these women who have poor metabolism or who have breast cancer histories, you know, that that's going to be a, a thing that probably all of them should be on some butyrate because if you repair some of that gut lining, you're going to markedly change. Remember all of that, the hepatic, you, you, your, your liver relies on butyrate too. And so, you know, so all these metabolic pathways rely on, on, uh, having adequate butyrate levels. So probably when we see these, you know, it's, it's it, once again, butyrate fixes everything, I think. And Betsy, that article I sent you the other day that talks about how it improves polyamines. So, right. oh my God. Right. So <laughs> spermidine, right? Spermidine. So polyamine spermidine, which we, <laughs> which was also the cure all, but the butyrate actually increased production of acromantia and that actually made polyamine levels higher. And so, so we're seeing this kind of joint too. If you can actually get butyrate levels up, we may, you know, be able to, so I think you can probably fix everything with butyrate and maybe, <laughs> little, maybe a little spermidine. Well, yeah, you still and need some hormones. hormones and, and, some and hormones, and hormones, and hormones right? You, hormones. You're not going to fix hormones by fixing the gut, but you're going to make them metabolize better, but you've got you to make I mean, the gut an environment that an environment, right. As much here. as you can. Right. Yeah. I love I it. Think it's a critical piece that we haven't really touched on. That's something that's I've been seeing in my office recently. I just want to sort of throw out there as a question and, a, and yeah. a, maybe you can help me. Um, and I think this is, this has been, this has been something interesting. It's probably brand, not brand new to y'all. Um, these thinner, more athletic women really don't need as much estrogen. And a lot of them really need, you even can get away with not giving them estrogen at all. And just giving them because a lot of them are used to um, doing this long time of having really very little estrogen their whole lives, especially women who've never been pregnant. So they're not ever used to it. This has become part of my history taking you know, tweaks on my history taking to ask when was your when did you feel the most amazing in your life? What, what was the physically best? Was it during your pregnancy? Was it pre you know period? Was it post period? Um, uh, you know, for confession reasons, mine was always, as soon as my period started, I felt amazing. And then five days later, I felt terrible for the rest of the month. And so, so what that shows is you're the, and the highest 
part of the highest part of the month where your testosterone is, is during that um, cycle. So what's critical to know about that for us as, and especially, you know, in our fifties and sixties and who are athletes is to know that your best time for competing is going to be that time. If you're still menstruating is going to be that time uh, either right around off population or during your cycle, because it's when your testosterone is the highest. So the best competing time will be that, that ovulation time or during, so if you're scheduling a race or you're scheduling a, you know, a powerlifting competition, plan on doing that. You know, if you can, if you can make the change, schedule it around your, around those two times, because otherwise it's not a huge difference, but you're going to definitely see that you're not going to hit your PR if you're trying to go at other times of the month. Interesting. Really interesting. But then you were saying that these thin athletic women post menopause don't seem to need as much estrogen in their, in their, in their yeah. hormone replacement therapy. I have a woman who I just put on testosterone, Me too. Um, you know, yeah. And they do great. Cause they're, remember they're going to convert, they're going to aromatize some of that testosterone down into estrogen. Yeah. And so oftentimes they, they, they feel better without any estrogen, especially some of those women that estrogen seems to just create a lot of side effects for them. And you can just get away with putting them on testosterone and progesterone. And oftentimes they will metabolize just enough into an estrogen pathway where they feel great. So I, I have a, a fair number of women like Suzanne's talking about that actually do great just with testosterone therapy. Yeah, I do too. I yeah. find it very, you know, very rewarding to yeah. see women because they were given estradiol before by whoever they were seeing before. And you know, they insisted on getting estrogen. And the truth is that they do so much better with very little of any estrogen yep. with testosterone and progesterone and yep. everything yep. else that we're doing to put together. And they, they're they much more effective in yeah. not just performance as far as um, athletic performance, but performance as far as everything life. else, brain, life, right. uh, mm -hmm. libido. Sexual health. Because right. I think... Right, libido. <laughs> Yep. And the two differences between the sexual health that is estrogen and the sexual health that is testosterone. Right. Yeah. The testosterone is like the, oh, I want to go have sex. The estrogen is, I feel sexy. Uh huh. I feel lovely. I feel, you know, it's, it's, the, that's where the estrogen, it's a little bit different. That the, um, and so, so it's critical that you're, if you're talking, if someone's coming in talking about not having any libido, not being interested in sex, you got to realize that both of those are contributing in different ways to different right. of that bit of a yin and yang thing, but then without the estrogen, is there not the issue of the, like just the, 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 the atrophy of the tissues, like vaginal tissue and stuff like that without the estrogen, or are you saying they arom aromatize enough of the testosterone somehow to yeah. just for what yeah, they the need? Yeah, the body adjust to getting a level where it wants it. So they seem to actually get a really nice estrogen level. And, and that's where, when we talk about Okay. Yes, we do. We use labs. Yes, but you have women all across the board on where they feel good. And I have some women who their estrogen levels could look very, very low, but they feel great. They look great. Everything's well. I'm not going to push them up on estrogen. So it's where you have to look at symptomatology and how people feel, and not labs as your as your labs help guide us. But the end all be all is how women feel. And I have women who, yeah, their estrogen levels. If I do the the dried urine test, their estrogen levels look pretty low, but they feel amazing and you know yeah. the, the body's adjusting to where it wants to be i love it that's amazing i love this okay so let me ask you ladies another question um is it ever and i think i mean you've already addressed this peripherally and uh, earlier in the discussion but let's talk about it directly is there um and is it ever too early or too late to start hormone replacement therapy no not too early, not too late, ever. As long as you're alive, you know, <laughs> we'll help you and hormones will help you. You know, as you get older and, you know, the, uh, again, the uh, conventional thinking is that, you know, don't start women who've been more than 10 years of postmenopause on hormones. That's not true. I started women in their 60s and okay. 70s on hormones yeah. and they've done amazingly yeah. well. Yeah. They okay. found their lives again. I mean, really? Yes. And as far as early, I think that it's something that Betsy said that's really important to keep in mind that we're not starting early enough because women yeah. start losing their testosterone, their testosterone really early and they need supplementation. So mm -hmm. with supplementation, you know, and the, the fact that we don't stress the importance of muscle in women um, is really 
Very important. So I have women, you know, I have 20 year olds. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and they're and, not just the performance athletes. No, they're, no, they're just women who, who right. Who, well, I'm know, wondering, do you think that it's possible that women are losing, they're low in testosterone really early because they're not doing the physical activity? Because there are certain types of exercise that, that support testosterone levels, right? So is it possible that if this, it's this sedentary kind of messed up lifestyle that's contributing to the declines in testosterone that are requiring the supplementation? Yeah. Or it's birth control pills or it's oh. um, environmental. If you're doing too much uh, cardio and not doing enough resistance training, that'll make a difference too, because you're not going to produce as much testosterone with cardio as you are uh, with resistance training. I've never heard of that. You? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Women, unfortunately, women care more about being thin, thin. than yeah. about having muscles. And yeah. I think that that's a really sad state for the women because metabolically speaking not having muscle is a lot worse than being you know right yeah. Yeah. Don't have a little weight on you and have muscle yeah, exactly but, but and if you look at the models yeah. and the people who are the influencers they're these skinny little people they're skinny and no muscle right. yeah we were just yeah. talking about this you know you know erica lives in you know in with new york and the women come in, the biggest complaint is not, I want to be more muscular. It's I want to be thinner. You know, yeah. it's always, I want to be more thin, not yeah. I want to be more muscle. Yeah. You know, and you know it's interesting yeah. that what you were saying that, you know, the ones that are very thin, but yet they work out a lot um, are the ones who do the best with testosterone. They do so yeah. well with testosterone. And then they, then they, you know, other doctors who don't realize the balance, what we're talking about um, have given them estrogen and then they get into trouble. That's where the yeah. bias thing goes, gets into trouble because, yeah, um, because they don't need it. They don't need any of it. Then they get fat. They, you know, they put in half a pound, so they get very upset. Right. So. Well, and the paradox, <laughs> the paradox of chronic cardio is it can make you fat mm -hmm. and it often can lead to more body fat, right? Because yeah. Yeah, story, I mean, story fat, increased cortisol. Yeah. yeah. Wrong kind of fat. Right. <laughs> well, is there a right kind? Of, well, there is a right kind of fat. There's yeah, a little bit of right brown fat. fat. There is a, it's like, oh, yeah, we all want our back. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's what Erica's talking about, the skinny fat people. Those people you come in who they are skinny, but they still they still have that kind of loose, flabby look to them, right? They're, yeah. they're skinny, no but they, it's that skinny fat, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. And they get like the muscle. arms start hanging and then they get plastic surgery. How about just like... Build some muscle. It'll yeah. fill it in. It'll fill in the arm. Go lift some stuff. Um, okay, well, let me see. Have we left any? I mean, there's so much more to talk about, obviously, but uh, I want to respect everybody's time. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about? The, the, the only thing I can think of is growth hormone. We haven't really touched on that and how important I think that is as we go and as we yeah. age and how that helps your cells to choose to burn fat as a substrate, how it helps to improve the energy production of every cell. So eyeball cell, you know, tooth cell, tongue cell, whatever the cell, heart muscle cell, liver cell, all of those have to choose to, uh, to burn uh, fat, particularly as a substrate to increase their production of energy. Um, and so the most efficient way for you to do that is if you have adequate growth hormone. And again, yeah. it's one of the hormones that begins to decline around the age of 35. Um, I really try around my patients to not call it growth hormone, to instead call it youth hormone, because that's really what it is. What did you say? Um, what did you call it? Youth hormone. Youth, it is. True. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, I'm, when I'm talking about, if I'm talking about replacement, I'm not talking about replacing necessarily with the growth hormone itself. There are certainly cases where that that's uh, possible, but I think a better, more healthy way to do that is to replace with uh, growth hormone releasing hormone, growth uh, ghrelin agonists, anything that's going to um, allow the full release of your natural growth hormone at various periods throughout the day. It's three to five times for a man and, and seven to nine times for a woman. And as long as you're doing things that are going to allow your natural growth hormone to be released in a greater way, certainly getting adequate sleep will be the beginning of that. Mm. Um, but then also, as we go back to talking about resistance training will help you to improve your growth hormone. There are lots of things that we can do um, additionally to manipulate your body's production of that youth hormone. I love it. Anybody else on the growth hormone? 
Any other strategies? Because I'll tell you, I personally, I'm completely allergic to the GHRHs and GHRPs. Well, you know, I find I patients who like, you know, sometimes I find patients who love the, the synthetic growth hormone that people take that was before we were working with peptides. And um, I find that one way to do it is really to kind of alternate it, not continuously take one or the other. And they seem to be doing really well. Like people who will do like maybe if, and if you, I don't know what the allergy is or what you're not, you know, responding to. But I think that if you kind of maintain this, you know, the environment where there's enough growth hormone, you can alternate them and eventually like find the correct balance for you. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, that might be honestly for you. Like now it's, it's actually, there are people who do better with growth hormone. Yeah, no, uh, I, I mean, I can't. The, the last, remember we talked and you said, oh, maybe you just need it for Morellin. The last time I used yeah. it for Morellin, I thought I was going to tear my head off. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Why? What happened? What happened? I got like my scalp got itchy, the insides of my ears, my throat, my eyes. Like it was it was not pretty. And I think it was a very small dose because I was cautious because yeah. the, the combination of the CJC and a Primarellin causes a very significant site reaction, but this went systemic and I was like, okay, maybe we just won't do that anymore. <laughs> so Did you start at low dose? Did you start really low? Well, the first time, no, but this time, because I was going back in, I went like teeny tiny and it right. just, it was a very significant, Did unpleasant. You test that? Sorry? Did you try Tessa Morlin? I have not. I'm, I'm at this point, I'm afraid to try any of them anymore. I'm just worried because they're so similar that um, I should maybe try the Tessa. It's a little bit less homologous to the human. So it's probably, it might be tolerable. I don't know. Betsy, what do you think? Yeah, that's, that would be probably my next go-to. Or as, as uh, Erica said, you could, if you can get it, try synthetic growth hormone. Yeah. I mean, we used to use it all the time before we had peptides. Totally. <laughs> Still do. <laughs> no, that might be a project. Okay, well, um, I think I think we're going to wind down only because I know that uh, people have places to be and and things to do. This has been amazing. Thank you all so much. I am so. I don't know. I'm so honored to have the three of you here. <laughs> um, so while, starting with Erica and moving across the board, why don't we talk? I mean, Erica, I know you've written a bunch of books and, but why don't we give people your coordinates so they can follow you, reach out to you or come see you? Uh, you can find me at, on at Instagram at um, ES health or Dr. Erica to 18. And uh, ES Health is really the office, so I'm in New York. And my, my email is Dr. Yeah. Erica at ES Health. It's okay. easy. Amazing. Thank you. I'm happy to help anybody that needs help that Suzanne or Betsy are not available for. <laughs> That's right. We think of you as the overflow, Dr. Erica. That's right. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> These are... She's the smart one. I always call up when I have somebody who's not, who I can't figure out what to do with. Yeah, right. And I, don't, I, mean, I don't actually do very much without these two telling me how to do it. We just take a lot of cases back and forth between us all. So. I love it. <laughs> Lucky patients. Suzanne? Suzanne Turner. My office is Vine, as in Grapevine, Medical Associates in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I'm on... I'm on Instagram, Dr. S. Turner, and um, I'm on YouTube, Suzanne F. Turner, MD, um, and I'm in Atlanta. Amazing. And uh, Elizabeth, and or Ben, Elizabeth, you're <laughs> so by Bethy at Boulder Longevity Institute. So you can go to boulderlongevity.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Yurth. Um, so go there. The three of us also are putting out sort of a series where we get together periodically. Uh, we haven't we've posted we haven't posted them yet, but we'll be putting them up. It's just where the three of us do this, where we throw out a topic and the three of us sort of chat about it to try and get you guys and hitting everything you know about health in general. So um, so so look for those as well. We'll be putting those out um, as, as well, which is kind of fun. We the three of us really love getting together and talking and and trying to throw all of our opinions in. As you can see, we 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 all have our own little styles and doing things, but we really love talking to each other and getting that out to you guys so you hear different opinions. 
So Amazing. follow all of us and hopefully we'll get those, those series out to you as well. But okay. Thanks. So the, so the videos of the three of you, would that be under a different banner or that'll just kind of pop up under your it, different individual channel? It, it, it will be, we'll probably tie it into both. Um, well, it'll have its own banner. We've, we've filmed a couple of them. We just have to kind of get, get them out there. Uh, so they'll probably be under their own, their own series. And then we'll probably post them to ours as well, but we'll get those out to you guys. Amazing. Well, thank you again to all of you. This has been a pleasure and um, I look forward to watching all of your videos as they come out and uh, maybe we'll do this again. Thanks again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be heard and to be seen. If you'd like to connect with me directly or if you'd like to leave any comments or if you have any questions about this episode, please reach out to me directly through my website, natnidham.com. And of course, if you're not already a member of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Community on Facebook, that's where you'll find me every day. It's a short application. Just answer a couple of questions and you're in and interfacing with other amazing biohackers. Thanks again, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.